When Liz Kakowski was about 15 years old, a strange and terrifying occurrence began frequently afflicting the otherwise ordinary high schooler. With two siblings, seven and eight years older than her respectively, she had previously enjoyed being the only kid of the house. It meant she got the entire second story to herself. Her own bathroom, the empty bedrooms of her brother and sister kept the same for them in case they ever came home to visit, and her own room right at the middle of the hall. Most kids would naturally covet a situation like this, and Liz was no different. She loved the sense of independence. But eventually, a dark strangeness would plague her for an entire year of her life. Every night as she brushed her teeth in the bathroom, she felt a sense of dread begin to overcome her. She would only ever remember this recurring fear right as it came on, so it was not looming through the rest of the day as if it was wiped from her mind and then introduced in that bathroom before bed each evening. No matter what, she could not look up into the mirror after beginning to brush her teeth. An overwhelming paranoia in her mind told her that if she did, something would be staring back at her, something other than her own likeness, something dangerous. She would quickly spit out her toothpaste and wipe her mouth without taking a single glance at that mirror. That mirror to her was evil. As she would shuffle out of the room and head down the hallway, the fear and dread would not leave. She found herself every night running down the short hallway to her bedroom and jumping as quickly as she could into her bed. Like most kids, she felt more secure under the covers in her bed, only her eyes poking up from beneath the sheet, but the fear lingered. Despite uneasiness though, she would always fall asleep quickly and with ease. Finally, with relief from this horror, she could sleep. Only it wasn't over. Between midnight and 3 a.m., every night for that year, her mind suddenly sprang to life in the most vivid and realistic of dreams. In a dream, she would see herself lying in bed before suddenly switching to the point of view of something or someone slowly creeping down the hall towards her room. With frightening lucidity, she'd later recall thinking in the dream that whatever this thing was, it was the same thing she was afraid of seeing in her mirror. It passed the bathroom, Liz still viewing the dream as if through this entity's eyes. And eventually it would creep past her own room towards her brother's at the end of the hall. Just as relief began to enter Liz's mind, the entity stopped and slowly backtracked towards her room. As she lay helplessly asleep in her bed, her mind would dream as the thing pushed itself like a malignant mass of glowing evil through the wall and over her bed. And then snap. Her eyes would shoot open just before the creature lunged towards her. She quickly found that, though her eyes were open and her mind was indeed fully lucid, she could not move, not even a twitch of the eyebrow. And the back-bending weight of evil and malice and sorrow and despair lingered thick there in her room. She was not alone. But every night it would eventually subside. A flick of the finger would evolve to the clenching of her hands into fists, until finally, she was free again. As she was released, she would quickly descend back into a troubled sleep. When she awoke, she never remembered the terror of the previous night until she settled into her nighttime routine again the following day. Only a year later, when these terrifying experiences finally stopped, was she able to remember them fully. Almost a decade later, Well into a career of comedy writing that she shared with her brother, Craig Kukowski, Liz had almost forgotten the teenage haunt in her childhood home. Then one night at a writer's party in a local bar, a colleague started telling his best ghost stories. Folks had a good time and Craig thought he would share his own story. As her brother, eight years older than her, started talking, Liz's eyes welled with tears from an immediate sting of an old fear reawakened. Craig told how, in his junior year of high school, he would have this horrible and always vivid dream of something, something very evil, slowly creeping down the hall, past Liz's room and into his. He would bolt awake, but find he was completely unable to move. The presence would linger and stalk him from the corner of his doorway until he regained his mobility and sank back into a deep sleep. A sleep that, like his sister's several years later, would cause a sort of amnesia until the next night, when it happened again like clockwork around 3 a.m. What brought a thrill of terror driving through Liz's consciousness as she heard her older brother recount this story 
was the fact that he had never once shared these details with her. Details that seemed startlingly similar to the horror she experienced in that very same house just a few years later. The nightmare, in its traditional sense, is a term seldom understood to many modern folk. Most may be more familiar with its new name, sleep paralysis. Even some of those who have experienced this don't understand that it actually does have a name, and it's relatively common to people. If they did not know of it already, the terror it inspires is often enough for them to try and forget that it ever happened. But this is nothing new. Visions of demons in the night, weights on the chest, old hag rides that lead to terror or even death, encounters with a succubus and shadow men lurking and stalking you from the corner of your paralyzed vision. Humans have been afraid and puzzled of this phenomena for their entire history. Even in the oldest Middle Eastern and Hebraic mythology, we find Lilith, the demon night witch who was supposedly Adam's first very evil wife. According to tales of Ben Sirah in the Jewish Talmud, she uttered an unspeakable name of God irreverently and was therefore condemned to be drowned in the Red Sea. But before she died, she negotiated with God. She claimed she was put on this earth to pray on healthy mothers-to-be and their children and asked that she be released from her punishment of death to endure the punishment of having all her night children taken away from her. According to the tale, she was set free to seduce men in their sleep in order to survive, only to have the offspring of the unholy union killed. In retaliation and vengeance, she did indeed terrorize young and healthy mothers as they gave birth to their first children. Now, obviously, this is a lie that's superimposed over the biblical account of history. But the myth may not all be rooted in fiction. Her more likely origins date back to her being recorded in the Sumerian king list of 2400 BC as one of four vampire demon women who was the cursed mother of Gilgamesh. All of these vampire women would terrorize men in the night while they dreamed and be forced to devour any children they bore from these demonic and rapine unions. At any rate, even the book of Isaiah mentions the screech owl who will dwell in the ruins of destroyed Edom in chapter 34, verse 14. Only, screech owl is a modern interpretation of what originally meant night monster, commonly understood to be Lilith, some demonic witch of Old Testament lore. Today, we call this being the succubus. But the first story of the actual nightmare, or nightmare as it was originally called, that demon thief that sits as a weight on your chest, making it hard to breathe and terrifying you as you wake up lucid but unable to move, comes from the Nordic story of King Van Landi, Found in the Inglinga saga of the 13th century, written by Snorri Sturluson, the story goes that King Van Landi of Uppsala is killed by a mara in the night that is conjured by the Finnish witch Huld. You see, the king had abandoned his wife in Finland and went to live in Iceland. So the queen bribed the evil witch Huld to send a Mara to either entice Van Landi to return home or to kill him should he refuse. As you may have guessed, he refused the summons. What follows is quoted from verse 16 of Inglinga Saga. He then became very drowsy and laid himself down to sleep. But when he had slept but a little while he cried out, saying that the Mara was treading upon him, his men hastened to him to help him. But when they took hold of his head, she trod on his legs. And when they laid hold of his legs, she pressed upon his head, and it was his death. The Swedes took his body and burnt it at the river called Skita, where a standing stone was raised over him. The first modern telling of a sleep paralysis or nightmare encounter comes from the notes of physician and professor Isbron von Diemerbrock. In the year 1689, he wrote the following in response to a curious case he had overseen, quote, a woman of 50 years of age, in good plight, fleshy, strong and plethoric, sometimes troubled with a headache, and catars falling upon her breast in the winter. The last winter, molested with no catars, but a very sore in the daytime. But in the nighttime, when she was composing herself to sleep, sometimes she believed the devil lay upon her and held her down. Sometimes that she was choked by a great dog or thief lying upon her breast, so that she could hardly speak or breathe. And when she endeavored to throw off the burden, she was not able to stir her members. 
And while she was in that strife, sometimes with great difficulty, she awoke of herself. Sometimes her husband, hearing her make a doleful, inarticular voice, waked her himself. At what time she was forced to sit up in bed to fetch her breath. Sometimes the same fit returned twice in a night upon her going again to rest. One could brush all of this off as a common tale told through history to explain lasting fear from a bad dream. I, though, am inclined to give these old stories more credit. Because even today, with all of our modern knowledge of the mind and our pseudo-scientific evolutionary framework of reality, these things still happen to people, many people, in fact, from different backgrounds and walks of life. And most of them, despite being told the logical explanation by their doctor, remain stubborn in the belief that what they encountered was real and very evil. Welcome to this episode of The Haunted Cosmos. My name is Ben Garrett, and I am joined as always by my friend and pastor, Brian Sauvé. Man, what a terrifying topic we have to talk about today, Ben. Okay, has this ever happened to you? Just right off the bat, I need to know. No, I've never had a sleep paralysis incident. Praise the Lord. Yeah, how happy are you I'm about so that? pleased. <laughs> like, I know some people, uh, I think there's there's a type of person who kind of, they secretly want to have some sort of supernatural encounter. I'm like, no, you, you young Christian yeah. man, you do not want, they're, they're demons. It's <laughs> Please, deep. like, no thank you. <laughs> you do not want the demons in your room at night. Like, No, definitely right not. There. I mean, especially when you can't move, because then yeah. you can't, like, go Jason Bourne on them, you know? that You can't do any of the elaborate scenarios you've thought out in your mind about how to deal with a nighttime intruder. Right. Right. You know, right. pulling out your Glocky Glock, <laughs> racking the slide. <laughs> boom. I mean, if just the slide rack itself will send yeah. them. Yeah. We'll send them running. I don't sure. actually. Everyone knows have to rack the slide because I'm a responsible gun owner and it's already racked. Anyway, I I don't. So mine's already racked, but I do it anyway because because <laughs> it gets me hyped. Just because in the movies, every time before they shoot someone, they rack the slide again. Every for shot, some reason, every shot. Yeah, golly. Yeah, but it, it, it totally off topic. Yes. Anyways, so Anyways. tonight we're talking about. As you may have guessed, sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis. The night dash mare. Yeah. And closely connected with this topic is the topic of shadow people. Yeah. Those lingering beings in the corner of your vision yeah. uh, that you swear aren't just like a trick of the light or in mm -hmm. your brain. They're actually there. Yeah. So when you first learned of shadow people and sleep paralysis, do you remember your knee jerk reaction? Like how long ago was this for you that you heard of this? I think the first time that I had heard of a shadow person phenomena or a hat man or sleep paralysis style nightmare scenarios, lucid dreams was probably around 2016, 2017. Yeah. And I immediately thought to myself, well, that's obviously demons. Okay. <laughs> I was like, you know, there was no, there was no, oh, you know, there's probably some scientific, there's probably in the amygdala, there's some yeah. sort of chemical imbalance uh, related to the REM sleep that goes wrong, similar to a hiccuping <laughs> phenomenon of the brain. No, it's like, that's demons. Yeah. Uh, demons. Same, same. I, I was like, this is, I mean, it doesn't get simpler than this. It's just demonic. Has that view evolved or like become more precise for you now? Or is it still just sort of this general, uh, this is demonic, but I, I don't really know how. It, the more I learned about this phenomenon, Ben, it was it was like the tip of the iceberg poking out of the water were these stories that you hear on the creepypasta Reddit type of world. Some of them I absolutely believe are fictional, fictionalized accounts, yeah, sure. people. Or at least like clicks, dram dramatized. Dramatized. Yeah. But some of them, <clears throat> I'm equally convinced, are real experiences that people have. I've heard from Christians who either earlier in their life experienced this or had family members experienced this that were highly plausible to me. And, and what happened is the more I learned about it, the more I developed a coherent theory, at least in my own mind, of how this functions and that what we're seeing here is a demonic strategy that takes many similar forms throughout history. Yeah. Stretching back to ancient times, to antiquity. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to have you elaborate on that a little bit more in just a moment. Sure. But first, I want to I, I ask you, because we both had the same knee-jerk reaction. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is demonic. Yeah. But why did we have that reaction? Mm -hmm. for, for me, there's these shared qualities between sleep paralysis and some other things that happen that, that I would say are highly strange. Yeah. One of those common denominators is an indescribable and overwhelming sense of dread mm -hmm. that people feel after they have these things. Yeah. 
to me, the, you know, the, the evolutionary uh, explanation is that your, your brain and your body kind of have this like miscommunication basically yeah. where your brain is awake, but it doesn't wake up your body yet. Yeah. So it gives you this really scary scene to kind of like jumpstart your body. Mm -hmm. The reason that I don't like that is because it seems to break evolution's own rules where what survival or like what survival tool would you gain by waking up and continuing to feel like absolutely terrified and being of, of everything paralyzed. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, that doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so when you couple that with stuff like the Bigfoot, which we're not going to talk about today, but Hey, but we are going to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, we will. But it's Some not other just today. Yeah. It's not just natural because people have way too much fear. Yeah. After they encounter so that was the big telltale sign for me. Mm -hmm. But is it was it different for you? Yeah, I mean, that was a lot of it. It's just the, the themes that come together across all of these folkloric sources and modern sources and biblical evidence that the the running theme is that this thing is evil. It hates me. It wants to destroy me. But then even this whole relationship of the, the rules that seem to apply where they're not allowed, they can only go so far. Yeah. They want to be welcomed in. Yeah. They are Which banished is... often by the name of Jesus. Yep. Things like that where people, their immediate instinct in many cases is to begin praying when they yeah. experience this and it's effective. If they're a Christian. If they're a Christian. Even if they're not, they think like, sometimes oh, even if wow, not, I need to pray. They immediately pray to Christ. Which is really striking. It reminds me of the sons of Sceva where you have these sort of exorcists that are Jewish that they use the name of Jesus, but they don't understand what it is. In that case, the demons literally attack and assault them. Yeah. I think God <laughs> allowed that to demonstrate that the name of Jesus isn't just a talisman. Yeah. But but there is some kind of spiritual overtone to all of the story that to me is is simply uh, not adequately explained through the materialist instinct. Yes. Even the whole, are you familiar with the study in, um, I think it was the Swedish doctors? Was it a on shadow people study? and sleep okay, paralysis? Okay, no, no, I'm not familiar Let me with give you some one. details. Let me, yeah. let me I, I have a- This has got to be good. I have a tab here. <laughs> I, this that is I have so great. Pulled up. Okay. <laughs> this is a study that was done by neurologist Olaf Blunk of the Brain Mind Institute in Lausanne, Switzerland, and some colleagues of his. And they were attempting to identify at this time um, what was causing epileptic seizures in a young woman. She was in her early 20s. Okay. And so they 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 took and in surgically implanted electrodes to various re like parts of her brain. And they started stimulating different parts of her brain. And an interesting thing they discovered is that when they stimulated this very specific part of the brain, it's called the TPJ, the left temporoparietal junction, uh, they could create the illusion of what some, some uh, summaries of the study call a shadow person. Now, seriously? Yeah. If you get into the details of the study, it wasn't exactly the same though. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... They were stimulating a portion of the brain and they, they could say that oh, the woman felt a presence of like near her. Yeah. And uh, they compared it to schizophrenic delusions and things like that. So you have these scientific explanations of sleep paralysis where they kind of take th that, that, that kind of study and then they'll, they'll look at like the way that REM sleep works, mm -hmm. where our body is paralyzed. Essentially, so we don't, yeah, yeah. We don't hurt ourselves. So we don't act out or dreams. Or our spouse. <laughs> Last night, my son came into our room and he was like, he has, he sleepwalks all the time, as I did, sometimes out of the house as a, as a lad. And he was like, I've got to get the, uh, my, uh, the TNT. <laughs> and we were like, what, buddy? He was like, I got to get this, the TNT. <laughs> and then we were like, okay, buddy, do you need to go to the bathroom? Do so <laughs> Somnambulism, sleepwalking is is a, a misfiring of this kind of process. Yeah. People start moving. But when you put all that together, what what I think you're you're missing here is the sheer consistency yes. of the experiences, the clear spiritual overtones, and the, the 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 sheer evil of them. Yeah. And to me, that is just simply not satisfying when you when you start to just say that it's some chemicals misfiring in your brain and yeah I, I don't like it I don't like it mm -hmm. and th there's a reason that we included that first story in the cold open the Kakowski mm -hmm. siblings Liz and Craig great point yeah th there's a reason we picked that story A it's really creepy uh, and, and interesting but B why was it so I mean it was the 
borderline the exact same experience for yeah. the both of them. Yeah. Almost, it, in fact, it had almost evolved for Liz to become worse. Yeah. In a way, but the similarities were there. And it's the same house. It's brother, sister. Yeah. It skipped the middle sibling. A lot of people are like, oh, it's genetic. But it's none of their the parents, they've like asked their family. Yeah. None of them have, have ever had anything like this. Yep. It skipped the middle sibling and went to Liz. And it reminded me of kind of like w- what we harp on where it's these entities that are running plays mm-hmm. and they're trying to improve their game. Yeah. And so yeah. for Craig, it was it was terrifying, no doubt, but it, it seemed much worse for Liz. Can you imagine having the lucidity to see the POV of mm-hmm. something creeping down the hallway towards your room? Yeah. That it's would like a be horror movie. Horrifying. Ugh. So anyway, we included that because I think that really proves the point that this is yeah. this is more than just like oh some misfiring chemicals in the brain. Yeah, you have a, the same experience in the same house without any communication from the different parties. If you believe that the people giving the account, and it seems like it was a believable account, uh, I've I've heard the account first person from them. Yep, and it was it's it, they sound like very believable like this this yeah. actually seemed to have happened it was wild that they never talked about it and then she found out she like was like randomly. wait what happened to you yeah say that again that happened to me yeah eight years later five six seven ten years later i don't know crazy and it was also a similar portion of their childhood yeah just pretty much same time period i think for her yeah. it was like a year earlier it was a love temple parietal <laughs> Stimulation. Miss me with that. Yeah, please. miss me with that. Miss me with that. Get so out of here. Before we before we move on, because again, you mentioned this idea that that for all time and for all cultures, seemingly there's some really common denominators and yep. what they see. Before we get to that, because yep. that is a huge point that we have to hit. I got to ask, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about vampires, yep. which will happen. But what do you think about Lilith? Because I got <laughs> deep in the Lilith rabbit hole with yeah. this episode. So and got, and I'm, <laughs> I'm super into it now. <laughs> I was only I was only in a very superficial way familiar with the Lilith folklore. Yeah. And the and more familiar with <clears throat> other aspects of like the night demon, the succubus and yep. this stuff. The old hag kind of the old hag. Trope. Yeah. yeah. And uh and then you started connecting the dots on the two and it, it sort of blew my mind. And the the first thing that comes to mind is that there's just this disclaimer of the Talmudic Jewish tradition mm-hmm. is not biblical yeah. in its origin. No. It Absolutely is not. Extremely mystical. You get into whole. There's whole branches of Ju- Judaism post Christ where you get exactly what you would expect from a people who had rejected their Messiah. It's very in error. Oh, absolutely. you would say like extremely in error. Very mystical. And actually, it's pagan. Yeah, ca- absolutely. Kabbalistic Judaism, Talmudic stories. They're actually extremely blasphemous. Yeah. And so even this Lilith story is extremely, it's blasphemous. It's contra biblical. The, the, the account of Lilith as the first wife of Adam, of course, did not happen. Yeah. It upends everything that Christians confess. Yeah. But the point yeah. is that they didn't come up with that. Like we, we can say, oh, well, the, it's clearly not in the Bible that this yeah. happened. Yeah. So this did not happen. You know, we have a detailed description of creation and this yeah. is not part of it. So where did they get this? Yeah. Well, they got it from something older. Yeah, they're describing a real phenomena yeah. that you see crop up across many cultures and places and times of this night demon, night hag, witchy demon encounter yeah. that's, that is sexual, that is blasphemous, that is degrading and evil and contra-human. Yeah. Just the, all of these themes come together. And so for me, the Lilith story is yet another example of a culture giving a name and a story to an experience that people had yep, and then re- t- back, back explaining it through this folkloric De- sort of Degrading mythical. is a good yeah. word to use. You use the word degrading. All yeah. of these things are humiliating and degrading to yep. the image of God. That, that's part of the point. Yep. It seems to be the play they're running. One of the striking things with Lilith too, um, and again, you know, I don't want to talk too much about it because we'll talk about it more, but she is seemingly alluded to in the book of Isaiah. It's the it's yeah. the word that the Hebrews would use to uh, refer to Lilith. Yeah, and the really interesting thing is it uses the modern uh, term screech owl or night owl or yeah. whatever. And part of the legend is that these uh, vampiric you know demon women would have a human upper body, but they'd be kind of like a chimera where their mm. lower body would be like a vulture. Ugh. So even that translation just 
that's a whole well of connections yeah. that can be made. But Brian, one of the most prolific connections and commonalities between these experiences is a being that people have now commonly referred to as the hat man. Yeah. Can you walk us through the hat man phenomena and how it kind of lends a little bit more weight to us saying that this isn't just natural? Yeah, the hat man phenomena is absolutely terrifying. <laughs> it's this phenomena that relates to shadow people where shadow people are the entities that people are seeing during these sleep paralysis experiences. Some of them see these entities in wake waking moments as well. You'll have stories where people are, um, you know, maybe walking down a quiet street at late at night and they're alone or they'll be, you know, just somewhere isolated and in the dark and they'll see humanoid shadow figures, yep. sometimes with red eyes, sometimes with varying characteristics, yep. almost cloaked looking that will stay just on the edges and the periphery of the light and occasionally do, do as mundane of a thing as observe and just come with a sense of extreme dread. Yeah. Or even attack and assault people. Yes. You'll have stories where uh, people will be... Uh, There's one story that I, that I remember. This is in our notes, just kind of off the cuff. I remember a story of uh, a, a couple that were sinfully cohabitating in their apartment. Such a shame. Come on, guys. Come on. You want demons? Sexual sin. Yeah, just, just fornicate. Just That'll ask for them. Just saying. Simple as. And uh, the, they, they, they had this continued encounter where um, the one of the couple would experience sleep paralysis, this vivid dream of a shadow person with a hat, mm. wearing a top hat, the hat man who shows up over and over in these encounters. And he would even come and choke the person experiencing this dude and they would be strangled and one of the experiences really it, it, it's fascinating is the other partner was awake and looking at the, the 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 i think it was the girlfriend who was experiencing the sleep paralysis and he could see what was happening to her that she was stopping breathing and struggling but couldn't move and he like came and shook her awake and she told him what was happening so he couldn't see it yeah but she was experiencing it over and over and over and over. And so this, this phenomenon just seems to occur, this entity, the hat man, this sort of demonic black figure with a top hat shows up in many accounts. Yeah. The thing that makes it weird is the hat. Yeah, why you know, the hat? Why, why, like why, what is the evolutionary uh, uh, explanation for, for there being a hat? That's not a common thing that you'd see on a humanoid um, shape that you make in your brain. Yeah. When you think of a human, you don't think of a guy wearing a hat. No. That's such an oddity. Now, many believe the hat man to be some ancient spiritual entity that's mm -hmm. been depicted in lore from almost every culture as far back as one pleases. And this would explain why there's a hat there. And this entity is the Grim Reaper. <laughs> Mm -hmm. According to Welsh legend, <laughs> the man we colloquially refer to as the Grim Reaper was actually named Anku. He appears as a man or skeleton wearing a black robe and large hat that always conceals his face. In another legend, he's, a, he's just a shadow that lingers on the outskirts of one's vision or, like you said, on the outskirts of a light source. He's said to drive a large black coach pulled by four black horses he uses to collect the souls of the dead. The medievals thought he was some cursed first child of Adam and Eve. Again, that's a little ridiculous. That was kept secret due to his demonic and grotesque love of death. Some also say that he's just the first dead person in whatever village he lives in to die that year. And his punishment for being the first person of the year to die is that he has to see through to the afterlife the rest of the people that die that year. That actually reminds me of a Haitian voodoo. Yes. Legend. Remind me to... Yeah, let... Let me, back. let me keep so going. So one more thing. Yeah, so keep going. That's more of like a medieval slash modern Christianized take on this Anku yeah. thing. I mean, it's problematic, obviously, but it's there. They were looking for an explanation, but there's an even deeper explanation that's far more demonic and to me, pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. And that comes from, from the neo-pagan Hellenistic Greeks. According to one modern pagan posting on Reddit, he's apparently an expert in, uh, in modern Hellenism. He says, Hermes is the Greek God who is the messenger of the gods. 
constantly traveling from the divine realm to the physical plane and into the underworld. One of his underlooked divine roles is to deliver the dreams down onto us in the physical plane and to guide deceased spirits to the underworld as a shepherd of souls. One of his key attributes is a cloak and a patassos, which in Greek is a sacred hat that Hermes alone wears. Wow. And he has a overall benign, according to this man, yet very cunning, almost trickster-like personality. There's that archetype mm. of trickster that shows up in lore all the time. Yeah. This explains why most report seeing Hermes during sleep paralysis. When Hermes shows himself in a physical form to deliver your dreams and sleep visions from the astral plane. Think of an ancient mailman with a hat and all showing up to send you dreams and make sure you're doing all right. He is a Greek god, and so he rules over boundaries, meaning he's much above our attempts to banish him. He will still show up, and there's nothing ominous about it, according again to this man. Anyone in the Hellenism community will probably tell you that Hermes is the friendliest deity, deity that you've ever worked with. I think that fear is a natural response to the unknown, when in reality, the hat man could be an old god just doing his job. Don't be intimidated, this man says, and no, Hermes does not feed off your fears. Even though he's a trickster god, he's more lighthearted about it and harmless. Have you ever tried asking him to make himself unseen? And then he goes into mm. these tricks that people can use when they see the hat man to try and bring levity to the situation. This is so demonic, dude. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> hey, just so you know, this guy that fills you with an existential sense of dread, yeah, yeah. he's actually like pretty sure. He's a friendly god. Friend he's he's like a Casper, trickster. the friendly ghost. The Casper, the friendly god. <laughs> Hermes, the friendly god. Yeah. It's like... That, that's why I meant the beginning. These this demonic play over and over, and it takes different flavors. It's like it's like you go to the store to the ramen aisle. You can get the shrimp ramen. You can get the oriental flavor, which I have no idea what that means. Or like, what is oriental? The flavor I'm, of the orient. I'm sure it's teriyaki because <laughs> that's teriyaki. always what they do. It's teriyaki, <laughs> or the chicken or the beef. This is like you can have your modern atheistic mm -hmm. hat man encounters on creepy pasta, or you can have your neo pagan, you know, your neo -pagan encounter, <laughs> or you can have this Baron's. This is this is the Haitian connection here. That's that's fascinating to me because it's again this is a totally different culture. Haitian voodoo, which is, it's like a syncretism of Roman Catholicism with African religions and African sort of uh, traditional religions yes. from West and Central Africa. You see it develop between the 1500s and the 1800s. And uh, there's this being in the Haitian voodoo tradition who is an Iwa of the dead, which is kind of like a spiritual being, a category of spiritual being, kind of like Oloren is... Oh, yes. Uh, Amaya. 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 Yes. You know, in the Tolkienian tradition. That's, that, he becomes Gandalf, by the way. Yeah, he becomes for Gandalf. listeners that need to read more Tolkien. For uh, listeners who are kind of dumb. Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. Sorry. We love Read you. it, though. <laughs> Baron Samdi, and Samdi just means Saturday in, in this. It's like a French combination of French and some other languages. But uh, Baron Samdi is a being who is described as having a top hat, a black coat or tailcoat, dark glasses and then there are some details that are specific to the Haitian voodoo tradition where he has cotton plugs in his nose and basically the whole picture is supposed to be that he is like a corpse being prepared for burial in the Haitian tradition so he's just, just depicted as a black man with his face painted like a skull he speaks in a terrifying voice but he's related to obscenity debauchery mm. uh, death and Haitian graveyards often have a cross. They'll find the oldest male who died there, and they'll put, they'll basically dedicate his grave to Baron Sandi. Wow. Sometimes under the name Baron Lacroix. So yeah, there's a connection to that well. Absolutely. Sledge. Wow. And, and and they'll put a hat on the cross. It's this Roman Catholicism, like, and to me, you look at the way these folklore tradition to develop. They're often like a bastardization of. Christian faith, the same way the Talmudic legend was, right, right. they try to co-opt the Christian story, but remove the gospel and the true worship of the true God into death and horror and yep. evil and debauchery and wickedness and disgusting black demonic. And they get people to like start to offer worship or start to yeah. fear these entities. And so to me, it's like, it's just, it's a demonic strategy. That's, I think that it might be Haitian also. There's another Iwa named Papa Legba 
Mm-hmm. And w- these names are just amazing. Yeah. Papa Legba. And he's like a syncretism of some voodoo God and then also St. Peter and I think St. Anthony. Mm. It's supposed to be kind of all of them coalesced into one. And he is the more positive take on that. Yeah. Where he's associated with the fathering of children. Mm. So people will pray to this uh, like syncretism saint to watch over their kids if they can't be with them. Yeah. Like if a bunch of kids are playing outside, you know, they may ask Papa Legba to keep them safe. The point mm. is, and this isn't new, it's just like what you're saying. When you get this syncretism vibe going on, it's like a blended up version of yeah. light and dark where you're trying to bring in the obvious and objective beauty of Christianity into something that's ugly. Yep. But when you blend up the light and dark, you're just left with this amorphous gray that's gross. You skip the dark. It, it's powerless and it's yeah. disgusting. Yeah. Um, and so that's why a lot of these legends have been lost to time because ultimately while they're talking about real things, they're giving unsatisfying answers. And so they've, they've made themselves obsolete. And like with the Hellenistic example, at least it's a real answer. It's evil. I mean, it's completely yeah. evil, but at least it's an answer that people mm. are satisfied with. Have we told the story of the mother of cats account here yet? No, but we. I was just about to say, we've got to get into just some stories. Of yeah, that, man, because these are terrifying. So please. They, they flesh it out a little bit here. Take it away. This is an account from a Reddit poster. And you'll see a lot of these, you know, people see Reddit, oh, it's all made up, creepypasta. And again, I need to make sure we don't use these terms without defining them. Creepypasta is a website or series of websites. It developed from a portmanteau. Portmanteau is like the word smog, smoke, and fog jammed yeah. together. It basically came from copy and paste. Yeah. C and P, co- I think copy, it started, paste, creepypasta. It was really a, a popular, first of all, in 4chan. Yeah. And then it's it's become this Reddit Developed. thing too. Yeah. So creepypasta, people copy and paste stories and things like that. They write their own stories. A lot of them are fictionalized. Um, however, some of them are actual accounts that people tell that are their own personal accounts. These stories, for example, that we're going to tell, they're from a subreddit or just an entire website dedicated to the hat man. Yeah. So it's not a creepypasta subreddit. Mm-hmm. It's something that, you know, supposedly these people really believe this happened. Yeah. So they're not trying to fictionalize or dramatize it. And you'll see that and they're creepy, but they're not overly creepy. You can tell the difference. Yeah, they're not like to, over the top you know, scary. Where people know? Are like, yeah. So anyway, this is from the account of the mother of cats, zero, zero. He said, I've been researching this figure entity, whatever he is for a while since this happened. I'm someone who digs into things and tries to figure out a rational explanation, but I'm honestly stumped. Anyways, this first encounter was quite disturbing. I have a history of extremely detailed dreams in general that I can remember for years. I was inside a house, not the nicest place, almost seemed as if it was 70s era house. There were other women inside with me and they were screaming. I looked outside the window and a lamp post was outside the window. There was a walkway gate and bushes visible too. He emerged from the lamp post as a shadow with glowing eyes and an old school top hat, a very long coat in all black. He walked towards the home and I immediately felt the need to go to the door and checked to make sure it was locked. It was locked, but when he touched the handle, it fell apart and hit the floor. He started pushing me towards a couch and attacking me. I fought back, pushed him off, and then he ran out of the door. The women seemed to calm down immediately. Second dream, he was standing at the foot of my bed, same exact clothing and those yellowish glowing eyes. Except this time, he smiled at me, and it looked like the Cheshire Cat grin from Alice in Wonderland. Like jagged teeth, too. I froze in fear, to be honest. Both experiences weren't pleasant for me. Like I said, I have a history of extreme detailed dreams or nightmares in general. But nothing ever felt this strange, terrifying, or imprinted upon my memory as these two. I like to think maybe he has an odd way of challenging people to face fear, perhaps. But another part of me thinks he might not have good intentions. I'm wondering if anyone else has been attacked by him. Perhaps seen him come out of a lamppost. Any similarities? I really like diving into the unknown. Thanks. Yeah, I got to say, the uh, her saying that he might not have good intentions, probably good instincts. <laughs> it's, it's so interesting to hear how people who don't understand the embattled nature of the cosmos, they don't understand spiritual war, they try to explain these things Yeah, through their own... Well, they want neutrality. You know? Yeah, they, they, they want there to be this kind of like yin and yang. And, you know, maybe he's just, a, again, maybe he's just... This entity that teaches people to face their fears. Yeah. It's this <laughs> idea that there's, that within everyone, there's uh, there's some good, there's some bad. 
And you can't have purity in both. You can't have yeah. a purely good thing. You can't have a purely evil thing. There's another account. Uh, this is from another Redditor whose name will be edited because it was inappropriate. Uh, but let's just call her the goat because the word goat was involved. She says, when this happened to me, I did not even realize that it had happened to other people. I looked it up after the fact because it haunted me so terribly. But when I was younger, I'm 26 now, my dad went on a business trip. Whenever he went away, I would sleep with my mom and we'd have a girl's sleepover with her in the master bedroom. We watched Gilmore Girls with popcorn in bed. It was great. I fell asleep, but then in the middle of the night, I woke up. From the master with the door open, I could see the doorway of my room and it looked like there was a man with a top hat sitting on my bed. I got freaked, but convinced myself that it was my imagination. And so I continued to watch TV. I looked back over and now he was in the hallway standing up. I started freaking out and I tried to make myself fall asleep and blame it on my imagination. I had the urge to look one last time and he was in the doorway of the master bedroom. Top hat, trench coat, shadow figure is all I saw. I tried to wake up my mom, but she was still knocked out and I just pulled the sheets over me and didn't look again until I fell asleep. It truly still messes with me today because I know it was so real. And upon looking it up, I find it even crazier that I'm not alone and I need to know why. The thing that gets me about that one is that she tried to wake up her mom and mm. couldn't. Yeah. And also she was just like awake watching TV and he and the shadow, the hat man was still there. That, that is so scary to me. Yeah. Absolutely mind-blowing. Well, the, and these stories often have this element where they'll ha they'll blend sleeping and waking, but there will be a, a portion of the experience where they have a, a state of consciousness where they're awake and they still see this thing. Yeah. For a time. There there was even, um, there's a, I can't remember the guy's name. He's he's one of these guys. There's a category of, in fact, let me, let me just, for a moment. Yes, please. There's a category of, person that we're actually one of the reasons we're doing this show is because there aren't enough christian resources out there that are categorizing these spiritual phenomena and explaining them adequately to prepare people to understand and be ready yeah. to live in the world that we live in yes and to minister to people who are not christians who are being deceived by demonic entities and by this spiritual world into uh, a trusting in false gods, or or even just being degraded and horrified by them yeah. without yep. Christ. So there's there's an increased in, increased interest in this sort of category of stories and supernatural things, and this is a tremendously dangerous thing. On one hand, because a lot of people are going into this as like, oh, they're just fun stories, blah, 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 blah. They don't know that what's really happening here is these malevolent, ancient, undying, spiritual beings who want to kill you and drag your soul into hell, right? So you're, yeah. <laughs> you're like, that's bad. <laughs> yeah. So we want people to be equipped for them and to understand these stories. But you have this whole category of people who remind me of like the magician in Acts, who I think Simon the Magician. Yes, yeah, Simon of Cyrene. Si yeah, Simon of Cyrene, who he's a, a magician and he is you know, coming into Christianity and anyway, you can go read that story. But there are people like this that try to syncretize the two. There's an author that comes to mind. I'm trying to remember his name. He's written like 30 plus books on these sorts of things on black eyed kids. And oh yes. I know the guy. Uh, and he is one of these guys that dabbles between demonic stuff and like Roman Catholic stuff. And yeah, like he attends a Roman Catholic church. church yeah. And he yeah. thinks of it as magic. He thinks of it as a magic show where the priest is magically making the, the bread into Christ's body. And right. So he views it as this esoteric occultic sort of thing. He went to an, a, a school of the occult, learned all these things and then writes books about it. And so you have this kind of person who is fascinated with the spiritual and David Weatherly. David Weatherly, that's, that's right. You have a lot of guys like this who research in this field that you'll find if you start to try to categorize and understand and be able to respond to this sort of phenomena. Um, and you, we, you need to be careful. You need to be equipped to understand that a lot of these guys, their explanations, actually, are, it's not that they're all untrue. It's that they're actually describing demonic subterfuge that they themselves have been taken in by. Yeah. So this guy himself has had these kinds of experiences and even noted that as he studied them, he began to experience phenomena like this. Yeah. And so you need to be aware that 
you can't, this isn't like uh, a topic that you should just lightly take up and like, oh, uh, whatever. It's kind of funny. <laughs> Guess and, it'll be my thing. Now. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> no th- these are, these are demons who hate you and they hate, hate you. God and want to destroy you. Yes. So you need to be equipped for them. And, and I think that's a through line that just runs through all these stories is that they leave people often in a state of uh, horror and, but also in a state of deception. One of the best tools they have to deceive is even with just a seed of doubt mm-hmm. where they might evangelize you with a message of, ah, actually, maybe, maybe what you can see is all there is. Yeah. What do you think about that? So mm-hmm. there's this doubt aspect to it. Um, Brian, will you tell us the story of, so there's a, there's a website called the hatmanproject.com. Mm-hmm. This is so common that there's an entire website cataloging stories, mm-hmm. trying to determine what this thing is, what this uh, occurrence is. Will you tell us one of the stories from that website that's very striking? Yeah, no problem, Ben. Here's, here's the story from hatmanproject.com, this research project into this phenomenon. It says, quote, I saw him in 2014. I was 15 at the time and was going to bed. I and my grandma were alone in the house, and this was a regular home, no fancy things, just a basic condo. Our house was nearly impossible to break into since we had a security guy at the entrance and our condo was on the third floor. That night, after saying goodnight to my grandma, I climbed up from my bed and was checking on my phone. Then suddenly my door started to open. I curiously looked to the door because I thought my grandma came to say something. But all I saw was darkness. No face. No eyes. No, nothing. Just a black figure. I tried to scream, and I tried to touch my phone. I couldn't move a muscle, or or yet make any sounds. After a few seconds, which felt like an eternity, he slammed my door. was really scared, and I had to check on my grandma. She was watching TV. Before I even said a word, she said, Why did you slam your door? I couldn't respond. I couldn't explain, and I still wasn't able to talk. I shook it off after a few hours, but to this day, I still know it was the hat man. So here we go with the hat man able to move things. Manipulate the environment. Yeah, like really manipulate the environment. You got stories of people uh, dreaming about getting a glass of water and they see the hat man and then they wake up the next morning and there's a glass of water on their nightstand. Come on. That's crazy. That's crazy. Come on. And Ben, you know what's even crazier than this? What? So I tweeted the other day, something inspired by this because man, people don't realize speaking of demonic deception, there's this whole movement of people getting into hallucinogenics and uh, drugs to try and explore (coughs) the spiritual world, things like DMT and other things we'll talk about. You know who one of the people who's been getting into this is? Tell me. Aaron, Aaron Rodgers, Rodgers the my. quarterback. <laughs> like, this is pretty big. Yeah, t- tell us about Aaron Rodgers and what he's been up to. By the way, do not do this. Yeah, don't. It, it, take, look, hot tip. Don't. Don't do this. This is an example of what not to do. Aaron, the reason that this is so crazy is because this is a this is a big name guy. Yeah. This is not an obscure Redditor Main online. St- like, the guy you'll see selling car insurance in, on, on yeah. a, a Super Bowl ad. Yeah. You know, it's like, this is a famous guy. Guy who is uh, <laughs> performing at a high level of physical yeah. preparedness. Like, this is a top guy. And he said that on a trip to Peru, he was taking a drug which is called ayahuasca. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I have no idea. Uh, I'm, pr- I'm pretty yes. sure. It sounds right. It sounds, yeah, sounds, right. sounds legit. And it's, a, it, it's this herb that the indigenous peoples would use, and they still use it today, to alter one's thinking, uh, one's physical ability even, and then their emotions and senses. So y- y- you probably know where this is going, yep. but the old world people would use this to have communions with mm. their gods. No. you know, Yeah, it would enlighten the vision and all that stuff. So... Aaron Rodgers goes to Peru and he's like, why not? Let's try this thing. And he sees what he said was a mysterious character who was black, shadowy, and wearing a hat. And he actually referred to this man as the hat man. So it almost is like it gives them a title or something like that. Tell tell them about the rabbit. He said, so he said that this was a terrifying experience. He went and, and then he went on another trip to Peru. Okay, similar trip in the 2020 off season. And this time, again, for a second time, he tried this drug because he wanted to go on another adventurous journey, he said. Yeah. And he said, quote, referring to the hat man, he will sometimes appear in the distance. 
usually veiled by darkness, holding the corpse of a dead rabbit and sometimes a blade. Come on. If you're going to try and tell me that that's just a Come on. not good, neither good nor bad entity, I'm going to laugh in your face. What a, what a, like this whole, we got to do a whole episode on this sometime, this whole DMT world. Yeah, 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 we do. Actually. Because the, like the thumbnail sketch guys, people are doing hallucinogenic drugs. They're even studying this like Stanford, I think at this point. And they are going deep into this hallucinogenic state and across the world experiencing almost the same things, meeting entities. Yeah. That they think are like extra dimensional beings, right? And, and I'm like, and guess what? You're they, commuting they probably are. <laughs> with demons. Why do you think all the Native Americans every and everybody would be like, oh yeah, we're gonna smoke some of this uh, plant that we discovered helps us commune with our gods? Yeah, the demons, guys. They Stop love. It. Apparently, they love when you do the ganja and just cannot <laughs> think in your right mind. Just listen to your old KJV Southern Baptist <laughs> grandpa who says, "Stop doing the alcohol. Stop doing the, the reefer, <laughs> and you're gonna. The devil is going to get you." This is the thing. He's right. He was flipping right. <laughs> like, stop it. Well, Rogers went Don't on to do say, it. after these two experiences, he's now like terrified to be alone in the locker room. And, yeah. and he claims that anytime he is alone in the locker room, it's oh. not just that he feels scared. It's that the lights start flickering and then they go off one by one, getting closer to him. He says, quote, referring again to an experience with the hat man where he wasn't on any drugs. He's in the locker room. And he room. was awake. And he says, quote, it was behind me, not even breathing hard. I heard its feet hitting the ground in a constant rhythm. I ran to my car, opened the door, slammed it behind me and locked it as fast as I could. This is a top performance athlete yeah. who is scared out of his mind, sprinting to his car from the locker room he yeah. goes to every day and trying to lock it as fast as he can. And only has only things to lose by telling these stories. Oh, yeah. People I mean, are just going to think he's crazy. State Farm isn't going to be like, do we want the guy who's talking about <laughs> being chased by spiritual entities, hawking our car insurance, whatever insurance? Well, he know. already did the, the vaccine thing. And like he's already oh. blacklisted to a lot of people. Oh yeah, that's so right. Like this is this is suicidal for him. Yeah, this, this is, is like career suicide. This in a is way. like his Joe Rogan arc. Yeah, <laughs> his Joe his Rogan, Rogan deep arc. esoterica arc. <laughs> Brian, as we close out tonight, I want to leave our listeners with a with a couple truths. There are some primary things that I want you to take away from this episode. One of them is that these things are real. I hope something that yeah. we've gotten across tonight has been that th this isn't just flippant stories told by people who maybe they had a little bit too much to drink. Yeah. These things are real and they're very demonic. So you should be equipped as the Christian with the knowledge that you're not just battling against physical things in the world. Yep. Remember, you're battling powers and principalities by the power of Christ working in you. And I hope the other thing you take away is that as the Christian, you don't have to be terrified of these things if your fear is in the Lord. Remember that our primary enemy is not these demonic beings, but rather the old flesh that we wrestle with all the time. Christ has given us pure blood, and yet we have sitting on our shoulders, our redeemed shoulders, that lizard of the old flesh that wants to pull you back to sin and death. Kill the lizard in your own life first. Take dominion in your mind and heart by the fear of the Lord. And in your fear of the Lord, you will be equipped to stand courageous against all other things and all other occurrences. I hope that that's your takeaway from tonight. Yeah, that's so true, Ben. Even the Apostle Paul connects these things together. Our normal, everyday work of trusting in Christ is our victor, trusting in the forgiveness of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul is talking about the ordinary relationship of sin being repented of by a sinner in the congregation, and that sin, the forgiveness of Christ being extended to that sinner. And Paul even says that he's teaching them these things, this normal everyday Christianity 101 sort of stuff, quote, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. And so we know that the work of these spiritual realities of Satan and his minions is meant to distract us from Christ, to deceive people, and to pull the wool over their eyes. So, Yes, understand where these stories are coming from, their demonic origins. Be able to name them and to give them a name as a Christian and say, yep. that's not this God who's for you. That's not this thing trying to lead you into truth. That's not an extra dimensional being. That's not just neutral. It's not just neutral. Th those are demonic or stories. Those are demonic occurrences. Be prepared 
to fight them. But remember, as Ben said, that the most powerful way we fight them is by trusting in Christ, repenting of our own sin, being busy about the duties of Christian living. Let me leave you with one final story here to underline what some of these demonic strategies are looking like and taking the shape of so that as you may be in the workplace hear a coworker tell you a, a scary story that happened to them, you can name them and say, well, no, that's, that's demonic coworker. Let me point you to Christ. And this is another story from those same uh, Reddit projects that we shared. Quote, it started with me drifting off to a quick nap in between shifts at work. This nap felt better, though, like the sleep was heavier and deeper than usual. My body felt almost anchored to the bed, even though I was still at least half awake. Eventually, my eyes opened. They were heavy to find myself stuck. I could see and think. I could breathe fine, but I had no movement beyond that. As I came to grips with it, I noticed a black human-shaped mass in the corner of my room. It had this strangely punchy and really menacing presence about it, like it stuck out in great contrast against the rest of the room, made me scared immediately. Partly because even though it was a shadowy figure, I knew right away who it was or who it was supposed to be. I knew it was my father or somehow it was meant to be him. As it approached me, still unable to move, this strange buzzing noise in the background got louder and louder and this thing's presence felt more and more menacing and evil. Finally, right as it reached out its hand for the side of my bed, I snapped out of it. I was terrified. I couldn't sleep for a week. Did you know that patrons get access to bonus stories that didn't make it into the main episode, as well as early access to half of the season of Haunted Cosmos at a time? Support the show and get access to all kinds of great perks at patreon.com slash hauntedcosmos.